Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kelly Smith. I'm an assistant professor in the political science department. Um, I have been on this committee. This is my second year uh, on the committee, um, and I've really uh, enjoyed it so far. Um, and I will let the other committee members introduce themselves before we get into the PowerPoint. Um, so let's see if I can, sorry, I'm not used to this. Uh, maybe Johan, you can go first. Uh, sure, Kelly. So, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Johan Reppert. I teach in the World Languages and Cultures Department, also in the Honors Program. And like Kelly, is it is my second year on the PDC committee. Uh, Sean, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Kennard. I teach in the School of Music. And uh, Jesse, and then Carolyn. Sure. sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jesse Fox. I'm an associate professor in the Counselor Education Department. This is my first year on this committee, uh, so I'm, I'm learning a lot uh, in a short amount of time. Hi, I'm Carolyn Nicholson. I'm a professor in the School of Business. I'm in the Marketing Department. Okay, so I'm just going to go through some um, kind of basic information. I won't talk very long, and then uh, the rest of the time we can use for any of your specific questions. And the committee uh, and I will do our best to answer them. If there's anything that we can't answer at this time, we will write a note and get back to you uh, with that information, but we'll do the best that we can uh, tonight. So in general, um, the deadlines, um, you can see the summer grant deadlines and the sabbatical deadlines. Um, if you are applying for a sabbatical, it's important that you announce your intention to apply by September 28th. So before the um, sabbatical application is actually due, you have to um, announce your intention uh, to apply. Um, so just make a note of that. Uh, the sabbatical application is due 10-8. In the summer grants, you don't have to announce your attention to apply. You just need to submit your application um, on October 4th. The way the process works is once you've submitted the application at the application deadline, those proposals are forwarded to the chair or if your chair, you need to designate a fellow colleague, I think who's tenured, uh, I need to double check on that, a tenured colleague uh, to uh, kind of be the designee uh, evaluation writer. They will review your uh, proposal and uh, write an evaluation letter. Then that information will go to the, your respective deans and they will read that information and write an evaluation letter. At that point, we as a committee will sit down and read the applications. Um, and then we meet together uh, to determine uh, the awards. It is a competitive uh, award system. Um, and then we, we pass on our recommendations to the provost. And you can see in early December, you'll hear from the provost as to whether you have been awarded a summer grant or a sabbatical. Um, all of these dates uh, can be found in the information packets on the provost website under policies and procedures. So um, if you get forget any of these, these will all be under that information packet. Um, we put forth a couple of kind of recommendations for writing a strong proposal, having uh, some of us having read many of them last semester. Um, the first is to make sure to write for a general audience. It's very likely that uh, none of us are in your field. So uh, please write for us um, who, who, so limit the jargon. Um, please let us know what you're doing and why it's important to your field to somebody who's outside of the field. Um, with that being said, writing for a general audience doesn't mean writing generally about your proposal. We still wanna know uh, very specifically what you plan to do, how you're going to do it, and why it's important for you uh, to accomplish this research. Um, so make sure to be specific in, in your proposal, but write it um, for those of us who not, might not be familiar with a lot of the theories or uh, concepts that you are regularly working in. Um, the second is to make sure to explain how the project advances your research or creative expression. Um, so we wanna know um, the, what's the importance for this project for your discipline and what's the importance for you to further develop as a teacher scholar. So it's really important to um, address those points in your proposal. 
Third, we ask that you provide a tangible expected outcome for the project. Um, so for example, me and political science, a tangible outcome for a summer research project would be a, an article that I'm going to present at a conference and submit to a peer reviewed journal. Obviously that's not the same outcome across all, all kinds of fields that we have here, but um, we do wanna know what are you gonna produce at the end of uh, the outcome? Is it a book? Is it a chapter in a book? Is it um, in music? It could be many other um, things, but let us know kind of what the end result is going to be, what that end product will be. And it, with that, it's really helpful for us as a committee if you provide a timeline of what you're going to accomplish when over the award period. Um, so for the summer grants over the summer, for a sabbatical over the sabbatical um, time that you plan. And then fourth, if you are asking for any um, supplemental funding, uh, make sure to make a strong case for why that funding is important and why it's really crucial for you to be able to complete your research. Um, uh, and I'm gonna go over in the next slide some of the restrictions uh, in for that um, supplemental expenses. So you can use it for research travel. So say, for example, you need to go to um, a library in Mexico uh, to do your research. You can um, ask for funds for flights, et cetera, for that. Um, also materials, supplies, or equipments, um, or any type of other, uh, other kinds of expenses that you need to conduct your research. So for example, if you're doing interviews and need, um, are gonna pay for somebody to transcribe them, um, that would fall under those expenses. The things that are, and you need to connect that for why that's important for your project or being able to complete your project. You can't use those funds for to pay research assistance, for publication costs, or for kind of the conference travel um, outside of the grant period. So there are some restrictions on that. But if you are asking for some mental expenses, please make sure to tell us exactly how much uh, you expect that you need. And why you uh, would need it for your project, because that will help us evaluate that. Okay. To submit the application, we're using the online forms. So you can find the information packet and the forms on the Provost website. If you go under policies and procedures, you can go to sabbaticals and then summer grants, and there's a link there to the information. So the link will um, take you to a page where you can find more the information packet and then as well as the link uh, to the summer grant application. So this is what you should be filling out um, when you're submitting your application. Okay. And then finally, this is the rubric that we use as a committee to evaluate each of the proposals. Um, so we really recommend that you have this rubric next to you as you're writing your proposal and as you're reviewing it um, to make sure that you hit on each of these points in the rubric. Um, if you want to use subheadings in your paper to address these specifically, please go ahead and do that um, because we do um, use this uh, rubric as we are looking at your proposal. So to have that pointed out to us how you're addressing each part of the rubric um, is really helpful um, for us to evaluate them uh, well. Um, and with that, I will turn it all to you. If any of my fellow committee members uh, realize that I forgot anything, please add it in now. Um, otherwise, uh, the floor is open for us to be as a committee as helpful as we can um, as you uh, both work through this process. So Sue or Carmen, do you guys do either have any questions? I can't um, see the hand raise. I usually use Teams, so I'm very unfamiliar with Zoom. So just, I can see your faces. So if you just <laughs> raise your hand, I can do it that way. I apologize for my Zoom incompetence. I do, I just need to, I emailed them. So I just need to find the email that I sent to the address. So Sue, if you'd like to go first, I'll just take a second here. Um, yeah, I have a question uh, both about um, the summer grant and sabbatical proposal. About the summer grant, now I'm kind of uh, opening the packet, information packet, um, and I see uh, the amount of supplementary uh, funding, uh, but I was wondering when I uh, applied 
uh, let's say kind of a couple of years ago, it was the up to $5,000. And during the pandemic, it was cut like half or under half. I, I, I do not have exact information, but I'm curious about what's the uh, basic amount allowed regardless of supplementary funding. And my second question is, I'm not uh, for um, sabbatical application for this year, but next year, I might chair recommend me to be aware of this process in advance, so that's why I'm participating. But I'm curious, um, is there any difference I should be aware when I apply for um, one semester versus to one year? Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, as for the funding, I'm not aware of all the details. I know that last year we were awarded about $4,800 per uh, uh, summer grant awardee. Um, I'm not off the top of my head aware of how much we have this semester um, or how many awards we're going to give. Um, but I think it was 4,800. And I, I think the year before that was around that amount as well. And that's not including the supplemental funding. So some people will just have that amount. And then others who need the supplemental funding might be able to get um, however much. Um, and again, I'm not sure how much that will be uh, this year. Um, as for your uh, second question, the real difference between your sabbatical proposal for a semester or a year is the scope of the project. Um, so that's really what we would want to know is, are you, um, are you doing a, the, a bigger project that is going to take you two semesters? Are you doing a smaller project that is gonna take you a semester? And I think this is where the timeline really helps us out, especially because again, we're from different disciplines. So something that you described to me, I would think, oh, that'll take a month. And it is actually something that's gonna take, you know, three to four months. And I don't know as a political scientist that that is, you know, what, what it's gonna be. So having that timeline to break down okay, for these few months, I'm going to be working on X, and then the next few months, I'm going to be working on Y, really helps us to understand what the scope of the project that you're undertaking. So the really on, only big difference about doing a half in the full year um, is the project that you describe and how kind of ambitious it is for the time period. But I'll, I'll open up to any of my committee members who um, might um, have anything to add on that. I will volunteer. So I will volunteer something, an opinion about that. I think one of the things that at least has been true in my school has been that our dean has a clearer notion, perhaps, than individual faculty do about what might qualify for a year sabbatical and not. And so it's certainly important that you consult with your chair and through your with your dean or associate deans indirectly um, or directly um, to find out what their guidelines are in terms of what might qualify for a full year because um, they are very uncommon in my school, but I know they're more common other places. And so, um, but that has been driven by um, the Dean's interpretation of policies, because ultimately, you know, for a full year sabbatical, you're going to have to have a Dean's and Chair's support for it. So I encourage you, if you're, if you're looking at going that direction, get information about what their metrics are, um, in addition to ours. I have a question related to that, actually, um, between one semester and one full year for sabbatical, um, is it correct that um, if you take a semester, it's full pay, and if you take a year, you only get half pay? That's my understanding. Yeah, that's my understanding as well, yes. Yeah. Also, I... I... I seem to remember not making a particular, uh, not evaluating the application differently, whether the sabbatical was made for six months sabbatical or one year sabbatical. I don't think we said, oh, well, if that person, if that person submitted a proposal for one year sabbatical, if that person had done only a six months, yeah, we would have gone for it. I, I, I don't think that was our way uh, to, to evaluate the proposal. It, I think, 
it, it might be in some cases slightly easier or, or feasible to apply for a six month sabbatical in many cases, and therefore the project is of a better quality. I think we, we evaluated and uh, Carolyn, Kelly, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, but that's how we thought about it. The, the, how strong was the application regardless uh, of uh, the, the length of the sabbatical? That's well, how yes, and we talked um, in the other information session about how a full year sabbatical might be expected to have um, more significant output, you know, um, you know, greater, greater scope or greater uh, stature of, of things that you might be producing from the sabbatical. Now, my understanding, um, I, we didn't come across this last year, and this is my second year on this committee, but if a person applies for a full year sabbatical, but it is not granted for a full year, they're not kicked out of the process entirely. They're still evaluated for a semester sabbatical. Am I, am I correct in that assumption? It's not like an all or nothing thing that if you apply for a year and don't get it, you have to wait and apply another year. I don't think that's the case. I mean, I know a colleague who applied for a year and was granted a semester. So I'm assuming that's a, a process that occurs here. That, that's a very good uh, point, Kelly. I actually do not remember. Kelly, do, do you remember? Because otherwise we can check later on. Yeah, no, I can't remember um, off the top of my head. I, I let, we might have to check on that one. Yeah, I don't think we had one that was in that situation mm -hmm. last year, but I don't know historically what that is. But my understanding is that if you apply for a year, but it's deemed to be not sufficient scope to qualify for a year that you would still be eligible for a semester. Um, but that's something we probably should verify. Any other questions? So um, I found my questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for hosting this session. As a new uh, hire, I'm basically doing some information um, seeking. So I had a couple of couple of questions. Um, I'm just skipping over to my written question. So the first one was really, um, I mean, I think you kind of explained this with regard to the scope. Uh, so I'm not looking at a sabbatical, obviously, in my first term, it would be for a summer grant. Um, but I'm interested to know kind of about the, the difference between when one would choose to apply for a summer grant, when they're traveling to a conference, for example, to present a paper that they do intend to um, extended to publication um, versus just using the um, travel funds that you know the arts and sciences offer for example I guess part of the question is around that you do have an output um, in mind and part of the question or you know a chapter of your book a forthcoming or etc and part of it I suppose is simply the scale of the of the funding so traditionally, we have not funded, as part of the summer grant funds, uh, a trip to present a paper at a conference, no matter the outcome. If it so happens that you, know, you need to visit an archive, a library, you need to interview some people for a project, and that somehow is tied to a conference, and therefore you know, the conference will help you develop uh, your paper, your presentation, what, what have you better, then yes, that is part uh, of the larger summer grant uh, project. But uh, I do not think, and again, I asked my colleagues to correct me if I'm wrong, that we would fund it uh, in the similar way as the, what is it called, the, 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 the regular funds. Yeah, tra travel funds or whatever they're called. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think it operates in, in the same way. We had a case last year when uh, someone was presenting at a conference, but that person also had to do some archival research nearby and uh, decided to present their the, the result of their archival research at a conference, but the, the conference itself was absolutely not a reason to, to fund, or was not enough by itself a reason. Mm -hmm to get funded to be a recipient of a summer grant. And okay, that's, so I, that's my understanding too, that if it's just for travel, it's it's not gonna fly. Um, we're looking for, you know, uh, original research or continued research or beginning a project. In the project, it could be various kind of stages, um, but doing that um, discovery or creative work 
during the sabbatical period. And what about something such as language study required to be able to look at some primary texts? Are you talking about whether the summer grant would fund some tuition for language studies? Is that what you're asking, Carmen? Basically, yes. Yeah, so uh, again, I'll ask my colleagues to correct me if I'm wrong. We had a similar uh, request last year. Uh, the, the technical answer would be no. Uh, if there is a particularly, like you cannot, you absolutely cannot do your project without that language training as a premise, for instance, then we, th that is a particular case that we'll need to see how you frame it in the proposal, but it would need to be absolutely unavoidable for the project. But uh, if it's additional, if it's something that helps you, and you know, no more than a, than a help, so to speak. It is my understanding that technically, no, we do not fund any uh, tuition or any courses or any programs or any degree of anything of that sort. But again, okay. so and the one and the one that if we're thinking about the same one, Johan, um, that did get some approval in a sabbatical context was because there actually was some research that was related to the particular training and the type of training it was. And, and so there was output expected from that, not just the certification itself. So things that involve archival research, going to a particular locale for exploration of X, Y, Z. Okay, thank I you. Do think, I do think it includes also for scientists, uh, I do think material for research, uh, that kind of thing is included because well, without that material, there can be no experiment. But, uh, but yeah. I, I do believe that those kinds of materials then are the property of Stetson. I think if that's correct. So you purchase them, but they would stay at Stetson. Okay, that's helpful. And then, I mean, that may answer uh, just the second question I had. Um, I was intrigued how the summer grant does indicate that um, support for uh, teaching is also, and of course it did say not for syllabus creation, but for example, if I was doing research related to pedagogical study, um, does that, is that similar to or different from, again, you know, that you'd have to be going to location to do analysis about pedagogical study? Like, I wonder if you could flesh out a little more what a successful grant might look like for this actual sake of, of um, teaching? Like what is that, what does, what is that considered? Well, pedagogy-based research is, is perfectly legitimate and lots of people, people do that. And that would be considered, at least in my mind, as valuable as, as you know, some other sort of discovery-based research. Um, I don't think there's any particular bias against pedagogy-based research, um, regardless of whether you travel for it or not. Yeah, I would agree with uh, what Carolyn says. Uh, again, like developing your syllabus or reading to develop your syllabus is not uh, probably going to be awarded. Right. Um, doing pedagogical uh, research, that's 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 okay. Just make sure to follow the same kind of guidelines in in the um, uh, in the grant application. What if that research was actually entailed in doing some kind of a community study that was at a conference, nevertheless? <laughs> That's the final caveat. Well, so uh, that's an interesting point. So, so we're not gonna um, typically, if you know, you submit your proposal and you say, "I want to go to, you know, Atlanta for this conference, and I'm presenting this paper um, that I've already done." Right? That's not something that we're we're funding. However, as Johan mentioned, we did have a situation last year where the conference was kind of an integral part to the uh, research process. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're gonna be doing research at the conference and that is really critical to um, your larger project, then I don't see why you can't uh, propose and argue uh, for that project. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. <laughs> If any other ones come up as you're writing the proposal or anything, feel free to continue to um, email. Are there any other questions?
Anyone else? Okay, well, we look forward uh, to reading your proposals. And again, if any other questions uh, come up in the meantime, please feel free uh, to email us and we will answer them to the best of our, um, of our abilities. And we look forward to seeing your applications. Bye everyone, I hope you all have a nice night.